working with with co-ops uk and also power to change because we we see that the need for innovation and diversity in people to have choices in social care particularly looking at home care um, and they were really interested to understand what the possibilities and, and potential was for community owned or cooperative uh, care models and wanted to work with local authorities commissioners and others to really understand um, where the opportunities were to make significant progress, what some of the questions were or blocks um, that may need to be understood better to encourage more people um, to support co the cooperative movement within social care. We've been having a community of practice of around 12 local authorities and this week we published our first interim report which lays out what we've learned um, and what's been shared up to this point. Um, we'll send on the links to everybody um, if we can in the chat, if not, we'll do that through email, um, but it's also available on the Sky and, and TLAP websites as well. Um, that presents a really good overview of, of what we've heard and, and found out so far. And today marks the start of a second phase of this project, which is when we're opening up the discussion and conversation to more people who are interested in understanding the potential and opportunities for, for cooperative and community owned home care support. Um, and as I say, the level of interest today is, is hugely encouraging um, for, for that endeavour. Um, today we're going to hear from um, Jonathan Downs to give a, a commissioning perspective. We're also going to hear from Martin Walker and Barbara Booten, who have experience of setting up um, a cooperative in Doncaster. And then finally we'll hear from the procurement team, um, Chloe and, and Nikki, um, to get their perspectives as well. But before we go into the main event, I wanted to start and hand over to Rachel Mason, who is a member of the National Co-Production Advisory Group just to give a personal reflection of the importance of having that diversity of choice in the sorts of home care provision that's available to people. So we'll make a start with, with you, Rachel. Lovely, thank you. And uh, thank you for inviting me to, to come. Um, I just wanted to bring um, an exciting perspective for me because as soon as I heard that this was gonna go on, I thought, ah, I've really, really got to kind of bring you um, uh, that perspective. So um, I'm, uh, a mum of two sons in their 30s with autism and learning disabilities um, and complex needs who have spent their whole lives in specialist services, whether that's specialist education and when they came through into adulthood, specialist day services and then specialist residential care. Now, what was commissioned for them may have met their diagnosis, may have met their pre presenting need. But for me, what was being commissioned wasn't necessarily co-produced with us and looking and trying to achieve our families or their own life outcomes. So what we did, because the specialist education was out of county, day services were miles away from their community, the residential care accommodation support uh, was out of their community, we decided as a family to take a direct payment. Now with that direct payment, we could then have that um, permission for want of a better word, but to start looking at local housing, at our local community assets, at our local activities, um, how to be part of a community and valued by their community and start being more visible to their community rather than just being invisible people that had eligible needs for social care that were being supported. But what we found was that the big framework providers seemed to kind of hold all of the workforce so for a while, we really, really struggled to get a local PA, employ a local PA. Um, but then we had uh, um, community catalysts come into the area and they started encouraging local people that wanted to change hearts and minds and the approach to uh, support in their local community to have micro providers. And again, I think that approach completely and utterly changed uh, the way that our, our sons succeeded um, in the community. With direct payments, we also were individual commissioners, if you like, we were like micro commissioners. And gradually, as I started meeting other direct payment holders locally, as I met other self-funders, older people that were self-funders perhaps, but we had knowledge that we could share with each other. We had activities that were, were not siloed because of learning disabilities or autism or older people. We had the same interest in common. We had the same activities in common. And so we started pooling our budgets, be it direct payments or self-funder, um, and the way that we naturally commissioned, if you like, as a community, is we were more, for me, I think we were more effective. 
Um, we certainly got better value, but it was natural. It was a natural way to meet our outcomes, address our needs, but meet our outcomes at the same time. So I think what you're doing of starting to look at commissioning at a community level is to start mapping and bring us, co-produce with the people within those communities, what are their outcomes that they're trying to achieve? What are their assets? What's out there? But also what I want you to think about through today is also how can you get your big current providers to start collaborating? And instead of send, pulling their workforce out of those communities, is there an opportunity for all these different providers to collaborate and have a cooperative of their staff that work so I live in those communities and those villages to, to work in in those uh, communities as well. Keep keep people local, keep people connected and valued. That's perfect. Thank you, Rachel. Um, just before I introduce um, the first speaker, um, just to encourage people to use the chat facility, we do have time built in at the end for Q&A, but with the number of people on the call um, and the amount we've got to try and pack in, that it would be quite limited to how many questions we can actually run through. So throughout all the presentations from, from Rachel's and from everyone else you hear um, for the rest of the, today's meeting, if you have a question, if you have an idea, if you have an example or something you want to bring into the discussion, which you may not have time to touch on today, then do stick it in chat. Um, we will either, once that we can find ready-made answers or, or address them, we'll do that as a Q&A wrap up um, after today's event. But anything that is, is new, fresh thinking or something that, that needs to be explored and discussed, we'll take that into the, the community of practice going forward and make sure we maintain the, the links and make sure that the, the information and learning gets recycled with everybody. So I'm going to introduce the, um, the second speaker today, who is Jonathan Downs. And Jonathan's a corporate policy lead at Oldham Metropolitan Council. And Jonathan has chaired the Cooperative Council's Innovations Network, um, Network's officer group for five years, um, who's commissioning projects to develop Greater Manchester's um, cooperative economy. So there's a lot that Jonathan um, has um, practical knowledge and experience of. Um, and I'm very pleased to, to welcome Jonathan down today's uh, session. Oh, thank you for having me in. It's uh, it's really great to be here. Um, before I start, I just wanted to say thank you as well to, to Rachel for what was an incredibly um, inspiring uh, introduction to this session. As a father who has a son with autism myself and going through the process of trying to get a personal budget and other uh, and trying to get the right specialist provision for my for my son, it's really really positive to hear from someone who's managed to make that work in, in such a positive and cooperative way. So uh, so thank you, Rachel. Um, as, as Ian says, um, I am the policy lead at Oldham Council. Um, I also chair the Co-op Council's Innovation Network Officer Group. Uh, just to give a little bit more background to what the Co-op Council's Innovation Network is, um, it brings together 35 local authorities from right across the UK uh, to think about how we find new cooperative ways of working with residents, partners and other public sector organisations to really tackle the challenges that are facing our communities. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. So I've been asked to speak about co-op cooperative commissioning and I think that's a really really interesting topic because in my experience most organizations don't deliberately set out to work with cooperatives it often happens by accident or by stealth um, as commissioners we tend to identify a service need we pull together a specification and we go out to the marketplace organizations submit their bids and sometimes sometimes we end up selecting a cooperative. Now what we're talking about here today is something radically different. We are talking about actively trying to work with cooperatives. This is a very different mindset. Um, it requires a real shift in how we traditionally commission services, uh, which is what I'm going to talk a little bit more about today. Um, before we go into any detail, though, and before we get to the next slide, I thought it would be helpful to reflect on Oldham's journey when it comes to cooperation. Um, and it really has been a journey. So in Oldham, we became a cooperative council, what we call a cooperative council in 2011. Um, we adopted a shiny new set of values and principles to support this. 
and we committed to working more closely with our partners and residents. However, as I'm sure many of you are aware, genuine cooperation doesn't always come easily, especially in large organisations. One of my personal first experiences of trying to set up a cooperative was in children's services and it failed miserably. So we'd been looking to spin out our sports development function. We undertook lots of engagement with staff and service users and felt like we had a really robust business case uh, for why we'd want to do that. But when it came to the crunch, the proposal was rejected. And I was reflecting last night on why, why did that happen? Uh, and I think there were a, a couple of key reasons. Firstly, we came at it with the wrong intention. The reason we decided at that moment in time to spin out the service was to plug a hole in our budget. And we thought that by spinning out the service, it would take the financial burden off the local authority and allow the service to become more competitive when bidding for regional sports development contracts. I think now we know that this was a pipe dream. Starting any commissioning, especially cooperative commissioning exercise with the intention of plugging a budget gap is doomed to failure. It's not cooperation, it's trying to pass the buck onto another organisation, uh, which does lead me nicely to my first slide, which is about the nuts and bolts of cooperative commissioning. So, oh, there we go. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the co-production slide. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so before giving this talk today, I was sent a series of questions that have been submitted in, in advance of this workshop. Um, now, don't get me wrong. The questions were, were brilliant. They were great. They focused on some of the real practical issues of working with cooperatives, for example, HR issues, to paying staff across, I really hope you're not disappointed, but I'm going to somewhat ignore those questions. And the reason for that is that every commission you undertake as commissioners is so different. All the different organisations that we work with when we're trying to do cooperative commissioning are so different. It's um, sort of, a, I hate using this, but in the in in sort of the words of the pop group, Banana Rama, it's, it's not what you do, it's the way that you do it that really counts when it comes to working cooperatively. And with that in mind, I'm going to focus my presentation on how we can create an environment where cooperatives can thrive, an environment where co-ops are encouraged to engage and work with the public sector and other organisations to innovate and drive real change across our communities and across our working practices. And the first real shift uh, or the first real step in, in doing this is a shift in, in our thinking. We need to stop thinking about ourselves as commissioners and instead focus on becoming co-producers. We're not simply trying to procure services. We're trying to fundamentally redesign how services are delivered for the good of the communities they serve and the people who work in those services. Cooperation is about putting service users and the workforce at the heart of service delivery processes um, and it's about thinking how we redesign services for the good of those communities. Recognising that lived experience is really key uh, and the voice of the people who experience those services is really key in that design process. So could we go to the next slide please? Oh, thank you. So when it comes to cooperative commissioning, co-production is the beating heart of the process. Uh, and when thinking about co-production, I like to refer to this diagram. If anyone's from Plymouth, they're probably going to recognise this diagram because like all good innovators, I, I stole it years ago from Plymouth and have used it in my own sort of thinking ever, ever since. Um, so following the failure of the sports development spin out I mentioned earlier, we put a lot of thought into why we wanted to commission cooperatively. What was the what was the real reason behind it? Why did we want to co-produce solutions with residents and partners? You might think the answer would be really obvious, but at the time, the idea of working cooperatively was still very new to us as an organisation. I always compare it to it's that sort of that old um, adage of turning an oil tanker. We knew what we wanted to turn, turn the ship around and head in a different direction, but like the oil tanker, turning the organisation took time, but it did start with some fundamental principles. Uh, those principles are 
that cooperative commissioning is fundamentally about helping to rebalance the relationship between the resident and the organisation. Our residents had at the time experienced years of top-down government. They were used to the local authority making all the decisions. And that was fine when we still had lots of money, it was easy. But as soon as the cash started to run out, it became much, much harder. And like any public sector organisation across the country, we started to have to make some really tough decisions about how services were delivered. However, our commitment was to put our residents at the heart of that process, ensuring again that that voice of lived experience went right through our commissioning practices. So, as I say, this meant really putting residents at the heart of the process. So that means giving far greater rights and responsibilities to residents and communities. And in the early days of our journey, to do that, we convened a lot of resident and service user forums to really get to grips with what we wanted to do as, as, a, as an organisation and as a place. Um, of course, that wasn't easy. It meant building trust, building capacity and co-producing solutions. And this often meant being prepared to be told that our traditional models of service delivery were not working and that can be really really tricky can't it from a commissioning perspective as a commissioner it can be so hard to be in a room with a group of people and being told that what you've done in the past just hasn't worked it hasn't achieved the right outcomes and but you've got to stick with it any change in how we design and deliver services is always we're going to be really hard at first. It tends to get really messy when we're doing this kind of redesign process in the middle, but it will often about incredible positive results at, at the end, but it is a process and you do have to be prepared to, to, to work through that and stick with it. Um, so in summary, this really does mean ensuring that commissioning is co-developed, that it's co-designed, it's co-produced and it's co-evaluated with service users, with the people who use and deliver uh, the services. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide just really gives um, a summary of how we can achieve better outcomes through cooperative uh, commissioning, what, what this actually means. So uh, in my experience, cooperative commissioning really does help prevent poor outcomes by really getting to grips with what people, people want. It's about talking to those service users as upstream as possible. So if you are in the process of developing a specification, it's already too late. You need to be thinking about when, when we're doing service design and, and delivery, bringing people together at the earliest possible opportunity and getting their input. Uh, it absolutely promotes choice and control through resident-led commissioning. This can be something that's really hard to get to grips with uh, as an organisation. Even a democratic organisation like a local authority can really struggle with the idea of resident-led commissioning. So we're going to talk in a little bit about how we bring the rest of our organisations on that journey with us as commissioners. Um, it definitely helps us manage demand by really using the natural uh, and local assets of our residents. So this is something that Rachel mentioned at, at the start. I'm not going to um, labour the point, but absolutely thinking about how we tap in to those um, those local pockets of expertise, those assets that exist in our communities, the people who are experiencing this every day, so, so important to bring those views into the service design process. Yeah. The advantage of this is it does build real engagement and trust. I think through our partnership approach and our cooperative approach in Oldham, we've started to have a really new relationship with a lot of our residents. There's, a, there's definitely is a lot more, a lot more trust. Um, that doesn't mean there's not also a lot of challenge in this kind of process. There's absolutely a lot of challenge, but being prepared to have that open and honest conversation is absolutely key to this. Um, we also find that through being taking this more cooperative approach, it really does drive social innovation. Um, so one of the things we found is that cooperatives and the communities that those cooperatives often serve tend to be really innovative organisations who've got really interesting ideas about how things can be shaped and delivered. Again, bringing that expertise into your organisation and working with those organisations to develop those new ways of working is incredibly valuable, 
uh, incredibly valuable and it's also incredibly liberating for those organizations who traditionally as we said at the start of this presentation are used to just seeing a specification and being asked to meet the needs of that specification rather than that process of co-design and co-development and it also promotes partnership working and makes the use of partners strength so again it's about recognizing that we don't know all the answers when it comes to commissioning services across our organizations and that sometimes that expertise sits right out in our communities just waiting to be to be tapped into um, so next slide please so one of my favorite examples of co-production in action is the newham co-production forum so for 10 years the newham co-production forum has brought together professionals in health and adult care council staff and residents and carers who use those local services providing an opportunity for providers and users to get to know one another and better understand how to deliver services that work for everyone i've been to a few presentations on the newer model and I think it's absolutely brilliant well worth a look up if you're thinking about um, developing this kind of uh, collaborative approach to service design and delivery. Um, the aim of the newer model is really to give new residents and those people who work in the borough a stronger voice so allowing them the to really influence and challenge Newham's health and social care services, how they're commissioned and, and provided. Um, next slide please Chiara. And again, another really fantastic example of co-production in action, the Manchester Parent Carers Forum, uh, again, who work to represent the voice of parents and carers of children and young people with uh, special educational needs and disabilities. They're a group of volunteer parents and carers, and they're working in partnership with local authorities across Manchester and other providers to make sure the services they plan and deliver meet the needs of Manchester families. Uh, some really, really fantastic work coming out of, coming out of that. Uh, and again, I'd encourage everyone on the call today to have a look at what they what they do, um, because, again, they work in that really open and transparent way. They're not afraid to challenge local authorities when they see bad practice, but they're also willing to add an awful lot of value to how we um, how we commission services and again they bring all parts of the system together to help design services that work for service users what these two examples hopefully illustrate is that co-production is a much more collaborative broad and deep process than commissioning alone than traditional commissioning models you need to be prepared to work to really understand both the needs of service users and the values and principles that you are hoping to achieve by working cooperatively um, it does take much longer and it starts at the very beginning. So i.e. the vision has to be co-produced with the parents, relatives, communities, commissioners and services. And it does definitely use a variety of engagement methods, focus groups, one-to-one -one meetings, surveys, interviews. You've got to be prepared to use that whole suite of engagement tools to really bring people into that design process. And I think, as I've already said, this isn't a simple process to follow. It varies from issue to issue, but by taking a cooperative approach and clearly communicating the values of your organisation and what you're hoping to achieve, you'll be creating a really safe and open and honest space for service design and delivery. Um, next slide, please, Kiara. So what's all this got to do with working with cooperatives? Uh, I'm sure some of you are sat there wondering why I'm talking about so much about co-production uh, when I promised to talk about how we can work more closely with cooperatives. Um, and you pro probably be right, we, we need to take everything I've been talking about and explore how we make that real. So let's talk about some practical steps that every commissioner can take when looking to work more closely with cooperatives and social enterprises. So one of the things that we did in Oldham firstly was undertake a mapping exercise of the cooperatives and social enterprises that were operating in our local area. Um, when we started working with cooperatives, we had a very limited intelligence base about who was already operating across the Manchester city region. So we undertook a mapping exercise to really help us to get to grips with who was out there and what they were delivering. You can't work with organisations if you don't know if they're, they're there. So it's worth spending some time working with your procurement teams to find out who you currently work with and to understand what the market currently looks like at a local level. Um, secondly, talking of procurement, 
do your procurement practices really lend themselves to commissioning cooperative organisations? So are you prepared to do the legwork we've been talking about, bringing partners and service users together to, to contribute to the design of services? So the value of working with cooperatives is they bring a huge amount of knowledge, expertise and understanding to the table. But if you are not prepared to let them help you shape and design your specs, your projects, your programmes, then I would argue that you probably need to look at your organisational values and principles. Are you really wanting to work cooperatively for the right reasons? Uh, I don't want to steal the thunder of any of the other speakers, especially those that are going to be talking about procurement later, so I'm not going to labour the point. But it is worth noting that you can give preference to cooperatives and social enterprises in your procurement practices. You just need a, a forward-thinking procurement team to help you do that. And thirdly, have you achieved organisational buy-in? So one of the biggest stumbling blocks we faced when trying to commission cooperative services was that the wider organisation wasn't ready to commit to giving away its influence over certain services. So working to really get that buy-in and get that understanding, especially if you're in a public sector organisation like myself, getting elected members bought into that process as early as possible is really key to success. As commissioners, it's easy to work in a bubble and think we've had a brilliant idea, but unless the rest of the organisation buys in, it's never going to fly. So you've got to put that thought in early to get in that wider buy-in. And the last point I want to make when it comes to practicalities is that your organisations, I keep mentioning values and principles, and that's because values and principles dictate how easy it is to work with cooperatives and social enterprises. So a good example of that is in 2019, we became a foundation living wage employer. So that means we've committed to paying all our staff across Oldham Council, the foundation living wage. It also means we've got to pay all our commission staff, adult social care, et cetera, the foundation living wage. Now that new rate that was announced in September is £10.90 an hour. That already makes it really a lot easier to work with a lot of cooperatives and a lot of organisations. Our values when it comes to paying staff a fair wage is already there. So those commitments that we make as an organisation to being as fair, open, honest, transparent and equitable as we possibly can be through adopting things like the Foundation Living Wage makes working with those kinds of cooperative organisations that bit easier down the road. So next slide, please, Chiara. So we've spoken about some of the challenges that Oldham has faced when we started our cooperative commissioning journey. And we've spoken about some of the changes we've made to our practices, um, making working cooperatively a more natural fit for our organisation. I want to quickly now talk about how that's had a positive impact on how we operate. So in 2019, in partnership with an organisation called E3M, who you may have uh, some of you may have already heard of or even worked with. We held an event in Oldham focusing on how we could create Northern Roots. So the ambition for Northern Roots is to create the UK's largest urban farm and eco park. So it's 160 acres of green space right in the heart of Oldham in a very urban area, but with um, this incredible 160 acres slap bang in the middle of it. Uh, it's an opportunity to create a truly unique community asset and visit a destination. However, we didn't just want to commission a delivery partner to do this. We didn't just want to do the old fashioned model of pull someone in, get them to design and deliver it all for us. We wanted to work in partnership with the community, creating a co cooperative to drive this work forwards. So we held an event with E3M, which brought together 85 participants to consider how Northern Roots could really stimulate local inclusive economic growth. And those Participants included council staff from departments right across the organisation, stakeholders from a wide range of Oldham's organisations and communities. It included social enterprises and representatives of, of interest, special interest groups. Um, and what this has resulted in is the creation of a charity founded on cooperative principles that's bringing together local residents and organisations to really drive forward a unique set of proposals focused on community growing, focused on food distribution and focused on the creation of new local food businesses. Uh, and this is making our, our original ambition a reality. It's an incredibly ambitious project and we have faced, as always, many challenges when it comes to making it a reality not least the prospect of giving over 160 acres of council owned land to a charitable trust. But we have succeeded. Uh, and that has been by co-producing solutions and working to really develop our 
organisational values and principles and by taking everyone across the organisation on that journey with us. Um, next slide, please, Chiara. Um, in terms of some other resources to look at, I know uh, Cliff and some of the colleagues are on the call today who were involved in this. I'd recommend the Greater Manchester Cooperative Commission report, a cooperative Greater Manchester. So this report provides a really detailed set of, set of recommendations to help to create the conditions for cooperatives to thrive in GM. Um, those recommendations include things like increasing the political leadership and visibility of cooperatives, looking at that, those procurement practices that we share across Greater Manchester, how do we bring cooperatives more into the ways of working across GM, um, thinking about how we lobby for greater legal reform to allow us to um, commission cooperatives a lot more easily and also thinking about how we increase those financial enablers so how do we put that seed funding in place to allow cooperatives to thrive uh, there's also work happening at the moment looking at how we work with our other partners across GM uh, looking at how we can make some of these recommendations a reality so through the co-op council's innovation network we've recently commissioned Anthony Collins solicitors who I can see is on the call today um, to do some work for us looking at how we can better support co-ops through GM's local authorities and that piece of work is kicking off in the next couple of weeks and there'll be a report hopefully available early next year and available on the Court Council's Innovation Network website to talk about how we've been doing some of that with, with Anthony Collins and some of the other organisations that are involved in, in that partnership. Okay, Chiara, final slide please. So I just wanted to briefly highlight some additional resources that I think could be really useful when it comes to thinking about um, cooperative commissioning. As I've already mentioned, I chair the officer group of the Co-op Council's Innovation Network. If you are a local authority or an organisation interested in cooperative ways of working, I'd really encourage you to engage with the Co-op Council's Innovation Network. There's some really fantastic case studies, some really fantastic examples of organisations who are really committed to embedding new cooperative commissioning practices. Um, we do a lot of knowledge sharing across the network, bringing different groups together to talk about this stuff on a regular basis. Um, we also put in seed funding for organisations to allow them to explore new ways of working. So that policy lab I just mentioned uh, in partnership with Anthony Collins solicitors, that is being funded by the Corp Council's Innovation Network. Uh, and we also give people the opportunity to go on study visits to organisations, like uh, to places like Mondragon in the Basque Country in Spain, incredible cooperative um, place we're visiting Mondragon uh, week after next we're going out on a study visit there to really see how this kind of cooperation can make a difference to a whole region not just to an organization or or, or, to, or to a small place but to, 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 a, to a region uh, and we've also been working with places like Cleveland in America and the Cleveland Cooperative Model. So there's lots of fantastic stuff on the Court Council's Innovation Network website. I'd really encourage you to engage. Um, I don't want to take up any more time. I know we've got a lot of other speakers today, so I'm going to say thank you for listening. I hope I added some value to the conversation today and thank you for having me. That's brilliant. Thank you, Jonathan. Incredibly rich um, presentation. I'm, I'm glad we've got it recorded and I've noticed people in chat wanting to know that they have copies of the slides, which you will send around, but we also have the recordings. So you better hear directly from, from Jonathan and refer back to it. Um, and I, I think if doing is the best way of learning, then Jonathan's definitely someone a lot of us will, will be going back to. Um, amazing um, activity that's going on um, up in Oldham. Um, we're going to move on now to hear from, that was the commissioning perspective. We're going to hear now from Martin Walker and Barbara, who have experience of setting up um, a cooperative in, in Doncaster. Uh, Martin is actually a policy um, associate for Think Local at Personal, um, but he was also involved with Doncaster Council previously, um, setting up People's First um, back in the day. Um, and Barbara has also had um, a long, strong and successful history of community development work, um, but who has herself um, a spinal injury um, from a young age, has been very active in the independent living movement. Um, and Martin and Barbara are going to talk about their, their own experience of, of, of setting up a um, a, a co-op in Doncaster. So is it Martin, is it to you first? Thanks very much Ian, mm. yep, thank you. Uh, and uh, 
Thank you for asking us to uh, come along. So anybody, I know there are one or two who know me on the call, so uh, it's going to be difficult for me to put my TLAC hat off because um, I guess we did what we did because uh, we wanted to make personalization real uh, in in Doncaster. Um, so we got some slack. Thanks. Thanks, Kira. Um, and, uh, and Barbara and I worked uh, <laughs> long and hard on this uh, in, in Doncaster, didn't we, Barbara? Um, trying to trying to make it work. Um, and I guess uh, the response, um, uh, Choices for Doncaster came up. up. Can we have the next slide, please? So this is what I'm I think we're going to cover today. Um, how do we come about? Uh, maybe more why we came about, how we got going. So I'm going to try and focus on that because um, I think it's important to say we've got going. And it's really interesting to hear, Jonathan, you know, you need to get your ducks lined up, um, you know, and making this happen in terms of getting a, a cooperative organisations uh, doing stuff in your patch. Um, it seems to be difficult. That was definitely our experience when we set up. There are my, when we set up back in 2016, um, when we first engaged with Co-op UK, we, we, we were of, of interest to them, I think, because the, um, there is low representation of cooperative organisations in the care and support sector compared to other sectors, I, I understand. Whether that's moved on, I don't think that's moved on very much, it seems to me. Um, so we're getting going, so some of the practicalities and where we're now, what we've learnt uh, and where next. Could we have the next slide, please? It's now a bit short for time. Um, so I guess um, I'll, I'll be straight. Uh, I did all that work at the council. Uh, there came a time, um, as, as I'm sure you've all experienced, when uh, Restructure came along. And, I, and my team was a, a real mixed bag at the time. You do, don't you? You kind of pick up functions. Uh, through restructures and it was sort of a bit of a mixed bag um, and uh, the restructure came along and, and my response was to try and argue a case to support some of the uh, some of the team that I've got uh, but maybe thinking about working differently um, so so that was a kind of background and history um, we've, uh, we've done lots of I've, I've, I've done lots of engagement community development work with with uh, with organizations lots of work around market facilitation and commissioning uh, not a commissioner myself work with commissioners we did some sort of seeding new day opportunity stuff um, lot, uh, uh, and um, I'd uh, did a lot of work trying to get an e-marketplace to work uh, and I've uh, still have the scars to be honest uh, and, um, and lots of process in improvement work so that whole sort of uh, set of things that you need to do to get personalization working in the way policy is laid out the care act talks about um, very much thinking about asset-based uh, uh, areas uh, and that whole um, really principally choice and control Put, it, put in people's hands. That that was kind of my legacy. I wrote a paper, um, uh, and uh, you'll see in a second it was probably a bit too radical for the council at the time. Um, but I, I was left feeling the council was open to a conversation once I'd left the council, uh, and I guess I I I, I thought there was a, a set of people that I could talk to about the ideas. Could we have the next slide, please? Uh, and the crazy idea, I guess, I call it a crazy idea, um, uh, just some of the components of that, you know, th definitely this sense of community-led led support, the model of community-led support, I've come across that as part of NDTI's work. I mean, I kind of just thought about those three words. It felt to me community-led support felt more, certainly at that point, about sort of community social work and social workers and council leading trying to facilitate communities coming together and thinking about how communities can support each other. That's how it felt to me. I think the three, three words kind of tell the story. Community-led support, how do you get to the community leading on support for itself? Collaboration, you know, that uh, the whole, uh, whole dialogue, that asset-based development kind of stuff, co-production, Jonathan's mentioned co-production. Anybody who knows me, I, I try and I try my best to live live and breathe co-production um, uh, if I can. Um, and connecting this 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 whole thing around, we we we've done quite a lot of work with social workers, thinking about 
you know, that asset based approach to, uh, to, to practice uh, and, and helping connecting and facilitating connections, that whole, whole set of stuff. And then I was kind of left thinking, well, what, what are the bits that are really sticky? And, and for me, these are the bits that are really sticky about trying to make this stuff work. Information and advice. You always come back to it. People don't know what they don't know. Navigation, navigating through the system. People really struggle to navigate through the system. Uh, people championing choice. I, I, I shall put it to you, practitioners, whilst... Um, don't always champion choice. We, we as a system don't always champion champion choice. Uh, we talk about it and we try to get there, but it doesn't feel to me like we're in that sort of place. And then market facilitation. I think we kind of market market sustainability has been the focus rather than perhaps market facilitation. And the idea was, well, could we create a spin out that that took on some of those functions that would release. Um, people to get on with stuff uh, and work much more closely with the community and understand its needs and individuals needs without the chains of, of uh, council bureaucracy. So Barbara, is there anything you want to say at this stage? That, they were the sorts of ideas I, I, I came along and talked to you about, weren't they? Uh, yeah, I think the only thing I wanted to add in here, Martin, was um, the fact that you there were a number of organizations and groups out there that you could reach to and that we were kind of we knew of each other and i think you're the, the only bit maybe you're going to come on to it was how long we spent um discussing our value base our shared value base yeah. and that and i think that's the only bit i wanted to add in here it's about time to allow the cooperative to develop because we we all came we were all doing different things out there and some from the private sector, bigger voluntary organisations, really small community groups, but getting that shared value base, that shared vision for the cooperative and then even the thinking, oh, is a cooperative what we want? None of us knew really what it was. Yeah. That time, I mean, I think it probably took us near on a year, I think, didn't it, Martin, oh, to, yeah, about of that. meeting and meeting and workshops and flip charts to, to get that really rooted and that really established and I think that is critical to the success of the co-op. I just want to just knit back to I mean I put some words on there it's usually clear and you've just said it Barbara you know I, I, I guess there were a set of people who I felt confident I could talk to you know and I think Jonathan you alluded to it you said something like um, genuine co-production doesn't always come easy it's not easy um, it's not always we don't it was very clear the people who I, who I felt confident to be able to share these ideas with and, and those organisations, you know, um, and, uh, the likes of Barbara. Um, and, and it was very clear to me those, I thought that would be a really difficult conversation. And that really played through when we started to, when we got, got going, launched the idea uh, and, start, uh, and got the organisation up and running, um, starting to engage with the, the broader Volcom sector, community sector, was well, a bit of a journey, I have to say, and, and we weren't received with open arms. We were, you know, it's kind of, what is this? And uh, uh, so those, um, so uh, it's difficult to, to pick through that. I, it's ju I'll just flag that. So um, can we have the next slide, please? Yeah, so we ended up in a sort of place, didn't we, Bob? Barbie, you've just started yeah. talking about that. We yeah, did, sorry. Probably up to a year. <laughs> we're trying to walk through form follows function and, and working out, well, what is it? What 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 is it? And how could we come together? You know, what are we trying to do? And it, and it essentially was a lean, a lean organisation, uh, 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 networking across. You explained this really well, Barbara. I'll come to you. Um, helping people navigate to really good forms of support. So that's another thing I should have put on the list. You know, that, that whole thing about quality. Who decides what or what a good quality service is? I think people should do that. That's my view. Um, and, and we all have a role in it, but uh, ultimately it's people that should decide what, 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 good, it, what good looks like. Um, navigating to good stuff uh, and um, recognising that we've got a whole set of organisations doing great stuff uh, in, in the town, um, but they don't all want to, and we do see that, you know, you put a contract out and, and, and an organisation say, oh, we could do that and evolve a type of support that another brilliant community organization is doing you know and just may may not be in a good place to be able to bid for a contract to do it 
So it's, that can be really frustrating uh, for those community organisations, seeing bigger organisations coming in, walking in, and taking taking contracts where uh, a bit of a bit of facilitation and uh, market facilitation could could bring about other results. Um, yeah. So uh, so we we went through finding a form, and we ended up. Uh, looking at co-ops uh, in terms of that form, but we, we we spent a long time on values and beliefs, and I've got another slide about values in a second, I think. So we looked at co-ops, and I, I I think the group felt there was a real read across between the values of social care and the values of cooperative. I mean, if you just look at those words, equity, fairness, equality, uh, self-help, self-response, I mean, they're very, very common and shared words and language that we that we use in social care are they not um and and so uh, a, a cooperative felt the right direction i think uh, barbara yeah absolutely yeah yeah could we have the next slide so given that they they were um seem to be is that seem to be the next that you know uh, we, sorry, what I should have said, we, we brought together a, 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 an interesting group of, I think, an interesting group of people. A user-led organisation, Sue Rider were doing stuff in uh, that was unique to Sue Rider. And they had a dementia care support service. We had a couple of don't care organisations involved. A brilliant, brilliant um, day opportunities and night opportunities for, for younger disabled people. Some community development work is doing brilliant stuff, essentially providing a community catalyst type of micro enterprise support, but also creating um, uh, their own uh, response to um, uh, the, the kind of lower level support services, really. An allotment society that, um, that had people with a learning disability just turning up and wanting to do stuff and, and they wanted to find ways to engage those people and find ways to, could we find a way of that person who has a, a day service place being able to use the, the money for that day service place to actually come along and uh, do something more uh, at our allotment society because that's what he wants to do, a community, a community organisation in a place doing great stuff. Uh, artists, networks of artists, and that sort of whole in that whole art for well-being space. Loads of organisations doing great stuff that we thought we could connect, um, help people connect with, and uh, so we ended up thinking about a multi-stakeholder cooperative. Jonathan, you talked about um, uh, co-production. I think uh, our organisation wants to be kind of. Um, well, this is our response to community-led support. Maybe the council shouldn't be doing this stuff. You, you could set up an organisation in the in uh, in the community or help the community set up an organ organisation. That's what we've done, um, and be part of it, uh, and be part of the steering of it, and where the profits go, directing that, the development of it. Um, so a multi-stakeholder multi-stakeholder co multi lends itself to that. There are three key components, you can see them there. Customers, that's the people-led bit, and we've made sure, did we not, Barbara, that mm. uh, people uh, have the voting um, uh, waiting, um, the, the casting arra uh, vote arrangements on uh, on the board. Um, uh, p uh, producers, people, you know, businesses, workers, uh, and then this, this other category, community supporters, and I think that's where there is scope for the council to be part of this uh, and be involved in its development and direction, uh, but not be in control, uh, which I think, you know, I, I don't know whether that's interesting or not to people. Do you want to say anything about that bit, Barbara, about the setup and the comp how we how we arrange that? No, only that that was critical to many of us staying part of it, the fact that it had to be customer controlled ultimately at that top level. Um, but that, I'd, in an ideal world, that, you know, starting from scratch, had the council been more open and willing to be a part of this and support this in a way, sort of saying, look, we're here to support it, we think it's a great idea, what can we do, then that would have been brilliant. And I think in a you know, neighbouring local authority, with learning from this and, and taking that view, and it's making all the difference that the council are on board from the start, but not in control. It's like we're here, we're supporting this because 
we know we can't keep doing what we've been doing any longer. That status quo is, is, is not enough. Things have got to change. And I think it's having trust and faith in the sectors out there that, that we, we have the skills, we have the knowledge, we have the experience, and we just need that bit of support. Just let us get on with it and, and do what we know how to do and do it well. And that doing it together is better. Yeah, quickly seeing, did you receive a grant to, your, to develop your cooperative? We had, we didn't receive a penny. We've not <laughs> had a penny. We've done it all ourselves. A lot of, I would say, uh, um, in-kind contribution. I was just going to get to the help from the Corp UK and the Hive and Sheffield Development Corp. We didn't get ourselves really in a good place, or maybe we didn't write good bids. We had a go. Uh, we had a good, we had a go with uh, lottery. Um, we had a go with... Um, uh, uh, power to change. We probably weren't in a, a good place to describe what we were trying to, and I don't think at the time, in terms of power to change's funding arrangements, we didn't have a good fit with their funding arrangements. Um, anyway, uh, we'll, we'll go on from that. So, but what we did have was brilliant support from Corp UK uh, in terms of getting got. So the difficult bit was working out. What, what, it, what it would be, bringing people together, sharing ideas, working out what our value base was, working out how we might work, all those things. The easy bit was setting up a co-op, I have to say. It was straightforward, with great support from the Hive at Co-op UK, not very expensive at all. Certainly, I don't think we, we got excellent value for money from the Hive. But, um, you know, I, clearly, they must subsidise it because... I don't know. It was only a couple of hundred quid for the for the support we got, but it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And they then connected us with other co-ops, which is one of the things, one of the principles there. We also had brilliant local, on the ground, practical, day-to-day -day support in terms of the setup arrangements and getting going, get registered. We went with a, a company. Uh, um, it, there's all kinds of ways you can con configure a, a co-op, but we went with a company. Uh, and a multi-stakeholder arrangement, which is embedded within the, uh, the Articles of Association. Dead, dead straightforward. Not, not difficult at all. Because of the way we, we thought about working, it didn't need a lot of investment. These organisations were already doing stuff and, and have a way of um, surviving. What we, surviving, operating. Uh, they have their own businesses. Um, uh, uh, the idea was to come together and, and coordinate much better. And as Barbara says, that actually has worked much better in the neighbouring local authority um, than, than in Doncaster. But that's largely because I don't think the council were ready for, for, for the idea. So where are we now? COVID definitely got in the way. I have to say, you know, I kind of was at the time at TLAP part time um, and uh, or doing, doing a number of days uh, as an associate. Uh, and that gave me time. It gave me time to get about out and about, do the networking with people, uh, do the networking with the council, um, do other tasks. Um, and uh, I just ran out of steam, to be honest, in terms of um, the council's readiness. The council clearly weren't ready for this uh, sort of uh, approach um, at the time. Uh, and um, I, I just lost, lost it, uh, ran out of steam with that and COVID got in the way. I'm really busy uh, all the way through COVID and, and since. Um, yeah, and as I've kind of said, the council got in the way, really. They weren't ready. They weren't certainly in the place Jonathan talked about. Um, but we have seen uh, uh, our collaboration as, as organisations really last and are coming out of COVID. We're ready again, I think, to start to, to think. And I think, I think to be fair, Doncaster's also may be in a place where it's thinking differently, definitely, in terms of their... One, one, of, the, one of the key factors I think has been... Uh, is really important to think about is churn of leadership in that. You know, people, uh, the people uh, who um, we network with, and people have moved on. People have moved on. And I think at, at the time, there was a series of interim leaders and commissioners you know they just ain't got the, the wherewithal to sort of focus down whereas Jonathan's I think it clearly you know has been able to spend a long time thinking about this in a, in a role um people have benefited so we're, we're a lot we're not we're, we're a very small scale we've got a, a we, we did get ourselves Chas registered we bid for a contract we 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 have got a contract with health now was was with the council 
Well, that's given us a little bit of lifeblood. Um, and uh, we've just turned that over. Uh, and uh, we have been able to navigate people on from, from a core funded service onto using their own money to purchase uh, a range of support from co-op members. Barbara, we're coming to you. Well, only to add, and I've just noticed someone's put in the chat about uh, some councils want to make radical change, but people see change as scary and in the community. And I, and I think that's really, really true. And I think as those of us out in the community, I mean, either an active independence and, you know, disabled persons use a led organisation and the other members of the cooperative do lots of different things. And that may be seen by some yeah, parents or disabled people as, oh, that's not for me. I don't feel safe. You know, I know it. You know, if I go to a day centre or whatever, I feel safe. So change isn't going to happen overnight. And I think that the best way that we do it is to let that change happen from the ground up, to foster it and support it. Um, and where there's pockets of really good practice, where people are doing different things, if that's nurtured, then people will begin to gravitate towards that and I think what we've got here in Doncaster I mean the fact that we've had Covid and it has been a little bit dormant but we're still keen and we're still interested shows that all of that groundwork absolutely is paying dividends now that we you know we still want this to work because we still believe that it's something worth doing um, and I think that's so important if it, it's it's good that councils are going to support this and want to do things differently because they've got to do things differently. But the way it's done, I think, is really important. It, it, you know, foster what's there, look what's out there. And I know it's difficult in a time of austerity and so much out in the community is gone. Um, and it's difficult to make those decisions about supporting community organisations and things like that when it's hard to even keep the core going. But if that doesn't happen, then the core is going to fail. We, we can support people in different ways and upstream. And all of that reduces the, the impact and the effect on, on, on diminishing budgets within local authorities. But yeah, watch this, but we're, we're, we're still here, aren't we, Martin? We're gonna yeah. make it happen yeah. somehow. Did you want to mention anything about, about, about uh, Rotherham? Yeah, sorry, Martin, sorry. I just because just yeah, of, time. Just of time, I'm afraid, yeah. but we could keep going on uh, for ages and get incredibly rich again um, from a slightly different perspective. And I, I think just that phrase, it's important. Council should be part of something, but not controlling it. Is is getting that the feel for it right, and the values right, and, and knowing the position, and knowing what how you do collaboration, and genuinely do that together is, is so important. Um, and it is a great example, um, which I'm keen to, to learn more from from both of you on. Um, just want to get time for um, Nikki and Chloe to get the view from procurement um, and get that perspective uh, as part of uh, of today's. Um, session as well. So Nikki and, and Chloe, can you go straight into your presentation, please? Thank you. And thank you to the previous speakers. I must say, oh, I've learned a lot this afternoon and this really does uh, exacerbate. This is very early thoughts from Islington. We are really early on in the journey. And I think having heard the other speakers, it's, it's been fascinating. Can I go to the next slide, please? So what I tried to think about was some of the challenges with traditional procurement. Um, the sheer volume of documents you get when you when you see a tender, the lengthy instructions, you've got detailed specifications, the language that's used, for example, in the standard selection questionnaire is very wordy and legal, and it's really not necessarily easy to understand. We're not helping ourselves here. Um, another issue that faces bidders is uh, the need for the ability to write concisely. So organisations need to answer questions and get key points of your proposal into a set word limit often, which can be really challenging, I think. Um, it's yet another skill organisations need to have. Not only do you have to think of great ideas for the service delivery, but you need to be able to explain it with a limited number of words. Um, I think processes can ask for a lot of work up front. Uh, you need to invest a lot of time and resource to complete a whole suite of tender documents, which is often not very helpful at all. And just awareness of opportunity. Um, how do you find out what councils are tendering for? So, for example, in Islington, we use the London Tenders Portal. Um, and if you're registered there, you should be notified of all new opportunities when they're published. But that also means you get the maximum amount of time to decide if you want to bid. And if you do want to bid, then how to prepare your bids. 
as opposed to stumbling across something at the last minute and then not being able to do it properly or rushing it and therefore having less chance of being awarded a contract. And next slide, please. So what is LinkedIn doing now? To be honest, a pretty traditional approach. Um, we are constrained by certain things. So the public sector procurement in the UK is all governed by the public contracts regulations 2015 at the moment. And the new procurement bill is currently going through parliament. Um, local organisations also, we are, um, local authorities, I beg your pardon, we, we have our own set of procurement rules, it's part of our constitution, it's another set of rules and regulations that we have to follow, so to some reason we are constrained, um, and this also is, is different from each local authority, which I think doesn't help the market because there's no consistency. So next slide please. So the progressive procurement strategy. Uh, Islington's progressive procurement strategy was agreed in 2020. We want to build community wealth and support an inclusive economy. We want to make sure as much as possible is spent still within the borough, within Islington. And we want to support Islington residents by creating employment, skills, training, other opportunities, we want more jobs, we want better pay, we want better terms of employment. And we also want to enable local organisations to successfully tender for council contracts. So how are we going to do that? We want to be transparent. We need to be more agile. We need to keep things simple. We need to remove jargon, use plain English. We need to have a shared understanding of language. Even the way that co-ops have been used today, it's, it's broadened my mind about the usage of that. So to have a great similar understanding is so important. Planning ahead is really useful. Prior information notices to give the market warning of what's coming up, but also having a longer term pipeline, a future forward plan so people can start to prepare for the future will be really useful. Obviously market testing and early market engagement is vital and also offering some practical support like training. Next slide, please. So what are we trying to do to move things on? What are our future plans? So we're really trying to explore the use of light touch more. Light touch can be used for social and other specific services as outlined in the public contracts regulations. We're looking into this, but unfortunately it's proving to be more challenging than we at first thought. And we don't feel actually that we still fully explored how flexible this can be. So this is an ongoing piece of work that we're trying to explore. Other ideas are looking at breaking down contracts into smaller lots with fewer requirements. Um, look at different formats for questions, so not just straightforward method statement questions, but perhaps looking for presentations or using scenario based questions. So it's more real life rather than just textbook answers. Allowing more time, we're very aware smaller organisations are resource have issues and therefore we need to allow sufficient time for people to not only do their day job, but also put in a bid for a tender. Social value is obviously absolutely key. Islington is committed to a minimum of 20% allocation of our award criteria goes on social value. Um, we're up looking at different options again around how, how we can actually get to that social value. Um, we're exploring things like looking at minimum deliverables and outcomes rather than broad open questions that are very difficult to respond to. Uh, we're also looking at the expectation for social value to be on a sliding scale, which is proportionate to the size of a contract in a similar um, situation, for example, home care. Um, and key to all this, of course, is going back to one of the first points that I made, ensuring people know where to find what the opportunities are in order that they can bid. But as you can see, it's still really, really early days for us, um, but I, I feel quite inspired by what I've heard today, so I hope we can move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Chloe. Shall I just come in briefly, um, if that's Yeah, right? please do, yeah. Um, just to add, so um, just to say, so I'm Nikki Ralph, I'm Head of Strategic um, uh, strategic Commissioning for AgeWell in Adult Social Care, and I've been working really closely with Chloe, who's one of our um, procurement colleagues, and with Legal, to really explore what we want from the future of commis um, commissioning of home care, what do we want from a home care model in the future that better meets the needs of residents, but also meets our inclusive economy um, ambitions and vision that Chloe talked about earlier and how we marry those two up and so working really closely with Chloe to think about 
you know, from a commissioning point of view, how do we procure that gives best opportunity for cooperatives and small community organisations to enter the home care market? And we know from hearing from colleagues on the call earlier that actually cooperatives aren't well represented in the care market and um, Islington is very committed to um, supporting more cooperatives. I just wanted to raise a few things. Um, so we're doing a whole range of things around home care and our future home care model. So we were asked to talk specifically about that procurement element. Um, but just in relation to that, I just wanted to highlight um, a few things. I suppose the first is around um, some of the challenges and the fact that by their very nature, cooperatives are not led by the council. They're not something that we dictate, that we're there instrumental in setting up and we design what the whole point of them are, that they, they are generated by the community with the support of the local authority. So therein is very significant challenge, which is about how do we empower and enable our communities and people and with expertise in our communities to um, identify that a cooperative is something they want to engage with and develop. And then how do we work with them to support that? And we are working with one cooperative to explore what we can do together, but also what we can learn from each other about what's good practice that enables um, more choice and control for residents and, and better outcomes. Um, and I think the other um, element, is, and Barbara mentioned it, is the time it takes to develop um, a cooperative um, and to build what we're hearing from the cooperative we're in conversation with is that it takes time to develop the infrastructure, but also the staffing capacity to then be in a position to bid for contracts. So it, it, it's very difficult because you need to have enough capacity to be able to hit the ground running to pick up packages of support. But without the the, the commitment of, um, you know, the amount of support and, and um, uh, work that they're going to get, you can't then commit how much staff you need. So it's, it's really tricky and we're working, working that through. Um, one element that we are exploring is around DPs and people talked about direct payments earlier and how important that actually is as an area that both benefits residents in giving more choice and control, but also my, um, one of the things we hear from residents who want direct payments is actually the challenge though around um, being an employer, about the sort of whole infrastructure and the, and the support and the systems they need that enable them to do that in a way that's as least stressful and less bureaucratic as possible. So there's a role for cooperatives as well in supporting direct payment users. And we're also talking with the cooperative around that as an initial element to sort of um, support locally. Um, the other thing that's happening in Islington is um, Cooperate Islington, which is being set up that's about giving grants and support to local cooperatives to help them develop. So we're, we're in links with them and we've got some workshops coming up to really learn about, um, uh, about how we can better support cooperatives um, locally. And I think the last thing just to add to what Chloe mentioned, and it relates to Graham's um, comment um, in the chat from Kirk Lees around how do we build in opportunities in the market to allow small providers and cooperatives to enter the market, because often you have long contracts that mean once it's signed, if a provider isn't at a place to bid, then they're ruled out for eight years or whatever the length of contract is. So we're looking with Chloe and legal colleagues at how we can build into our procurement process and approach opportunities that allow new providers, small providers to enter that market on a regular basis so that they're not ruled out and so they can develop um, and, and join the market at regular intervals. And how we can actually, just to pick up on Chloe's point, how we can develop, rather than one size fits all, recognise that actually different size of providers can actually meet different levels of need. So if we, for example, move to a locality model where there's different um, size block hours for home care, how we can vary those hours so that for a smaller provider, that number of hours feels achievable, so that we're not just ruling out smaller providers and only being... Um, of interest to larger providers. So we're trying, like Chloe said, it's it's an ongoing process, early days, and we really welcome hearing from any local authorities that are further ahead and that can share some of the learning, um, but really looking at ways that we can enable um, smaller providers and cooperatives to sort of enter the market and thrive in it and benefit residents and, and offer that more choice and control, but also through working around direct payments, how we can provide other ways of commissioning, as Rachel said right at the beginning, that are much more personalised and that individual commissioning approach can really be maximised. That's brilliant. Thank you, Nikki. Um, and thank you to all, all the speakers today. I'm afraid uh, time's against us in terms of the Q&A, um, but we will pick up everybody's comments um, in the chat and make sure we get all, all those responded to 
um, with including a recording of today um, and all the presentations. Um, so I'd just like to really thank uh, Rachel, John, Martin, Barbara, um, Chloe and Nikki for, I, mean, I found it a, a fascinating um, hour or hour and 10 minutes. Um, it managed to combine real values, real passion, um, vision and a determination to really change and do something different and not accept the status quo but with a, a level of detail and insight and learning um, that actually makes it feel as if this is tangible this is something possible we have examples and it is something that we can make genuine progress on so thank you everybody um, incredibly rich presentations um, we will certainly be going through them in a lot of detail and we'll be packaging them up in a, in a way to, to really pull out the key themes for everybody joined today um, our work with Power to Change and Co-op UK and the 12 councils um, is continuing about halfway through. We have the next phase will be much more of these events and opportunities for others to get involved. But for TLAP and, and I'm sure for Sky as well, our interest in this area is ongoing. It's been long standing and it will be go beyond this project as well. Um, and we would be really keen to hear from anybody's examples um, from anything, not just co-op and community owned, but anything that's that personalised, community-based, innovative, different approaches um, to long-standing challenges. Feed that back in. Um, you have our email and the contact address and see TLAP and, and, and Sky as, as an opportunity to really showcase, celebrate, but also connect across with other um, innovators and, and councils wanting to make a real difference in this area. So thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed um, the last hour and I hope you have too. Thank you.